So this morning we begin a new sermon series called So. Um, and uh, we're excited about it. And uh, what makes this series a little bit unique is that it will be shared by several of our pastors on staff. And so I have the privilege of beginning the series, but uh, several pastors in the weeks to come will be sharing um, messages from this series. And uh, we're excited about that. We're excited about seeing uh, what God's saying to them as well. And so uh, last week, we kind of picked up on this idea a little bit in um, Psalms 107, verse 37 through 39. It says, they sowed fields and planted vineyards that yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them and their numbers greatly increased and he did not let their herds diminish. Uh, I think that is really, really, really fascinating in that when we talk about, as we mentioned last week, this idea of then and then. If you were with us last week, we, we were talking about this idea of the difference between then with an A and then with an E and realizing that then with an A is this idea of comparison. Uh, how, how this or that or this or that. I'd rather have this than that. And we have this comparison game going on and we have that struggle all the time. But God says in his scripture in Psalm 107 that, that four different times he says, then God did something. And so we realize that God wants to do something next. And so we can't live in the then with the A, but we need to walk into the then, that God has something next for us. And he ended, the, the psalmist ends the scripture, this passage in Psalm 107, verse 37 and 38 and 39, with this idea that they began to be fruitful. They began to sow and plant and had fruitful harvests. And so I began to think about maybe the then is a season of sowing. That this idea that, that when we sow something, when we plant something, when we deposit something, then we can reap something, we can harvest something, there is a return. And it, it's not simply just in a financial sense or an agricultural sense, but we can sow, we can plant into our health by exercising, or we can sow and we can deposit into relationships or, or in ministry. And we can trust that when we sow, there's a process of sowing will bring about a return. That when you deposit something, a return comes. And, and I began uh, a couple months ago beginning and believing God for this series that, that there was so much that, that could go into that. That when we sow into something, when we deposit into something, that we can believe God and we can anticipate with God to reap in a great way. Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. He says, those who lack deposits will bring about a lack of return. Those who sow generously can then anticipate to reap generously. And so over this series, we're going to look at that process. We're going to look at the whole circle of the sow. And so there are many, many stops along this sow process that we're going to look at. And I'm really excited about some of the topics that some of the pastors have picked. But I wanted to begin this morning really looking at two different perspectives that begin the process. Two fundamental perspectives that are needed in the process. And, and one is found in the Mark chapter 4 passage, and, and one is found in the Proverbs 14 passage. And the first one that we need to recognize is we must admit that we don't know how the sow process happens. We don't know how God brings it about. He, it says there in Mark chapter 4, the man, he said... He, this was, the kingdom of God is like this. A man scatters seed on the ground, so we do what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to scatter seed. We're supposed to deposit things. We're supposed to scatter and sow and um, plant things. But then look what happens next. Verse 27, night and day, whether he sleeps or get, ups, get up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Let's just be honest. Let's admit from the beginning that when, when we sow and then we reap something, we really don't know how it happens. I mean, that's the truth of the matter is that whether he slept or he was awake, it says the seed sprouted, the seed grew. And so I want us to know, maybe that's a relief for you today, that when you sow something, when you plant something, God is the one that makes it grow. And we don't know how that happens. 
We don't know how it happens. And so we need to first realize and we first need to admit that we don't know how this happens. And then secondly, out of the Proverbs chapter 14 passage, we need to realize that the entire process must start with fear. Now it seems really odd. Fear? Yeah, but we're not talking about an ordinary fear. And so today I just want to kind of give a, a little um, disclaimer that, that this message and, and maybe this entire series is, is not a lot of sugar. There's a lot of meat in this. And so this, these words from the Bible are not going to be sugary. They're not going to be fluffy. They're not going to be sweet to our ears. But they're going to be good spiritual food that can fill our soul. And that's what today's message is. It's something that when we digest it, it will fill our soul and it will help us in a deep, deep way if we can get it on the inside. And so let's look and circle back to the Jesus, what Jesus explains in the Mark account. He says that the man, not God, scatters the seed. So church, listen, we are responsible for scattering. We are responsible for planting. And so we have a responsibility, each and every one of us, in each and every area of our life, that we need to be making deposits. We need to be making um, uh, planting things. And so if you want to have a harvest someday, if you want to bring about good re, uh, a, a, a good return, we need to be scattering. We need to be planting. And so that's the first thing we see Jesus saying. The man was the one that scattered the seed. And so the man does what the man does, and God does what God does. But the man does not know how God does what God does. And so here we have two questions. When we have this idea of sowing, or when we have this idea of planting, we really have two questions when it comes right down to it. Number one, what's it going to look like when it comes, right? I've been working really hard and I've really been doing this. What's that going to look like? What's the result going to be? If I work really hard, if I plant really hard, if I sow really hard, what's it going to look like? What can I expect it to look like? And the second thing is, when's it going to come? Well, we always want to know, when's it going to show up? Well, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? And so what we're interested in is the time it takes and the order he makes. <laughs> you know, if we believe God is the one that does it, we are interested in two things, the time it's going to take for it to come and the order he plans to make it in. Because if you continue to read in that parable, it says all by itself the soil produced grain, first the stock, then the head, and then a full kernel in the head. So we see here basically Jesus saying this is how the kingdom of God works. God doesn't normally do things instantaneously. Can I get an amen? Amen. He does it in process. And we would rather it not be in process, but most of the time God does things and brings about things and brings about the harvest in process. But he brings it about. And then there's a harvest. And so I'm reminded this morning that we can't show up with a sickle unless we've scattered the seed. All of us want to show up at the harvest time. All of us want to say, oh, here it is. This is it. Wow, let's bring it in. Let's get the sickle. Let's cut it all down. But we forget that, listen, our responsibility first and foremost was to be the scatterer, the planter. So is that your story as well? That similar to Mark chapter 4, is it your story that in you, when you think about it and you look back in your life, you don't really know how God did it? I mean, I don't know how God did it. I'm not sure how God did what he did in my life, but I'm grateful that he did it. And I believe that when we are faithful to deposit with God, he will bring about a harvest. So when I can trust him, when I can release control to him, God has the ability and the authority to do something. And so let my initial challenge to us this morning be, let's get back to sowing and planting and depositing. Instead of asking, when's it gonna happen? And what's it gonna look like when it shows up? Why don't we just get to the point of just basically giving God something to grow? Let's give God something to work with. Give God something to bless, even if we don't know how or when or what it's gonna look like. Because here's the danger, church. And I'm afraid that some of us are already past this and, and I want us to pull us back to the field. Many of us have left the field before we saw the harvest. 
We got so discouraged that the harvest hadn't come yet or it didn't look like we wanted it to look, we decided to leave the field. And I'm encouraging us in this year of 2018 that we would just commit to sowing, commit to planting, commit to the idea of depositing and trusting that God is the one that's going to grow it and work with it and bless it. Listen to a sermon by Susie's favorite pastor, Stephen Furtick, recently. He talks about how we have to synchronize our faith with God's schedule. Because see, if it's out of whack, somebody gets discouraged. God's letting me, go, letting me down. You know, but what happens is that we need to synchronize our faith with God's schedule. Because sometimes we're the farmer, sometimes we're the, we are the ones that scatter the seed, but sometimes we are the seed, amen? That sometimes God has planted us somewhere, and guess what, it's dark, and it's lonely. And we're afraid that the farmer has forgotten about us because we can't see the farmer anymore. See, once he planted us somewhere, once he has placed us somewhere, once he has deposited us into a situation, it sometimes gets dark and lonely because it hasn't happened yet. We haven't sprouted, we haven't developed, we haven't returned, we haven't begun to have the harvest yet in our life. And what we need to understand is that in the soil of uncertainty and vulnerability, we need to keep going and keep growing. Amen? How many of us know what it feels like to be a seed? How many of, our, how many of us are in the ground right now? And we're a little bit worried. Do, do, it, 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 are, you, are you paying attention? Can you see me? Do you know? I mean, where, where are we at in the schedule? Like, am I ready? Is it going to happen? Is it going to come? How long is it going to take? What's it going to look like? But Furtick reminds us that a seed is protected by the soil. It has a hard exterior. Not only is it protected, but it has provisions on the inside. Everything a seed needs to grow is on the inside. And then God brings the rain. And that every seed has potential to be released. And so we need to be reminded that the seed is on schedule, says Stephen Furtick. That their celebration will come. The harvest is coming. There's no need to waste energy worrying about what is coming, when it's coming, or how it's coming. Because honestly, we really don't know how anyways. We can't figure it out. God's not going to reveal to us the how He's going to show us the harvest when it comes. And so that has brought me to a point in my life and, and in the leadership of this church and really even in the development of this series, if we're going to talk about so, and our first perspective, our first presupposition, our first declaration is that we have no idea how it happens Maybe we should divert all of our efforts to the one who does. Instead of worrying about the harvest coming, instead of worrying about the process, maybe we ought to pay attention and divert our energies and our attention to the one who does. And so that's where the Proverbs passage comes into play here. Proverbs 14, 26. What's it say there? Let's see that again. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress. For his children, it will be a refuge. He who fears the Lord. Church, this may not make sense, but I hope it does in 10 or 15 minutes. The sowing and reaping process begins with fear because there is no other way. Any other way is faulty foundation. There's no way to overstate the importance of this, that within the fear of God, within the appropriate fear of God, everything one might need for faith, planting, and reaping is found. Everything you need begins with the fear of God. 278 times in the Bible, it references the fear of God. And so what is the fear of God? Because when we think about fear, we bring negative connotations. We bring 
things like groveling and dread or terror or trepidation or the idea of a slave and its master. I don't want to go there because I'm going to get in trouble. That is not the fear that we speak of this morning. The fear of God is of a reverence and awe, a sense of grandeur and majesty. It's the idea of loving respect a child would have for a parent. When you walk in to the room, there isn't a hunkering down or a crouching in the corner, but a loving respect that, that stimulates unreserved surrender. Here's an illustration, and I don't know if it works because I didn't say it out loud, I just wrote it down, so let's see how it fits. So the fear of God would be, oh yeah. The fear of a slave would be, oh no. (laughs) See, when, when we're afraid, when we're fearful, it's, oh no, oh no, oh no. But the fear of God is, oh yeah. Uh, yes, it's, it's more of a, it's an, an, an exhale, not an inhale. Like when you're afraid, you cower back and you suck in, right? But if you're really excited and you're, ex- it's an out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. So whoa is out, is in. I don't know, that try, I tried it out there, I just threw it out there. All right, we'll give that 50-50. Okay, I didn't say it all worked. That's just how it was working in my head yesterday. So here's the thing, what do we fear God about? What are we having reverence? What are we excited about? What are we in awe about? We're in awe and excited about his greatness, his sovereignty, which is his control, his holiness, his jealousy. Do you know you serve a jealous God? It says in the word of God that he is a jealous God. We serve a just God, we serve a righteous God, we serve a judgmental God, he is judgmental. We serve a God who has an amazing nature, an amazing character. We serve him because of his name, his word, and his works. I mean, think about this. The promises of God. The word of God says that the promises of God are exceedingly great and precious. They're commensurate with all our wants. And what that means is that there isn't a need or a want you have that a promise of God can't meet. I mean, there's tremendous comfort in that church. That there's nothing that you have experienced, that you have been planted in, that you are encountering, that you may encounter, that you have encountered, that the promises of God is not able to adapt to or meet in your life. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. That in Christ Jesus, church, there is not one promise that isn't yes for those who follow him. See, godly fear shrinks, shrinks back from sin. Worldly fear shrinks back from punishment. See, one doesn't want to, to get punished. One doesn't want to dip, displease the father. I mean, that's what godly fear is. is When we have godly fear, when we're fear of God, we don't want to disappoint the Father. See, we often hear that fear prevents confidence and sometimes destroys confidence. But the fear of God, the fear of the Lord, produces confidence. Now, I'm going to stay there for a second because that was kind of complicated. So often, we think that when we're in a fearful situation, we have less confidence And sometimes when we remain in that fearful uh, situation, it destroys our confidence. But when you have the fear of the Lord, it produces confidence. I mean, that's what Proverbs 14 is saying, is that when you fear the Lord, you have a secure fortress. Other translations talk about a confidence, a mighty confidence. And so I want you to know today, and when we talk about the sowing process, that in anything that you're trying to sow, anything that you're trying to deposit this year, anything that you're trying to plant this year, it must begin with the fear of the Lord. Because when we have the appropriate fear of the Lord, we can have confidence. How, how many of us want confidence today? We want to be confident that God is going to do what God said he's going to do. That God, even though we don't know how it works, we can be confident that God works. Amen? I mean, church, I know I told you, I I promised you this isn't going to be sugary. This is meaty. But this is the truth. That 
Fear of the Lord does not prevent confidence. It does not destroy our confidence. The fear of the Lord produces confidence. How many know there is a confidence which is perfectly consistent with deep humility? See, the most confident people in the world have nothing to prove, amen? You know, the person that's out there trying to always prove themselves and prove themselves, that's maybe a sign that they're not confident. When you have a confidence in the Lord, when you have a confidence in God, when you have a fear of the Lord, you will have a mighty confidence. And so this Proverbs passage says, he who fears the Lord has a secure fortress. A secure fortress, a confidence. Uh, and in church, when we have this complete reconciliation, when we have made our, our relationship with, with God right through Jesus Christ, that relationship then is this father-child relationship. It brings a confidence in one's labor. Church, the reason why we can be confident in the Lord, we can be confident in what we want to sow, what we want to plant, what we want to deposit this year, is because when it's done under the guidance of God, it's empowered by God, and it's dedicated to God, and it will be successful. Do, Do you believe that today, church? That which is done under the guidance of God will be empowered by God, dedicated to God, and be successful. That's a wonderful promise today. That anything that we do under the guidance of God, that is empowered by God and is dedicated to God, will be successful. So when we sow in confidence, when we deposit in confidence, when we plant something in confidence through the entire process, it must begin with this fear of the Lord. The second part of that verse, it says, he who fears the Lord has secure confidence for his children. Church, did you know, and I'm sure you know know this, but you've heard this, but I want you to digest it today, that you are a child of God. You're a child of God. You are one that God has his eye on. He, you are one that he loves. You are one that his heart is turned towards. You are one that he wants to communicate with. And church, I want us to realize this, that this is not, a, this is not an inborn quality. This idea of the fear of the Lord, this confidence in the Lord, it is something that we must learn through instruction and experience. Just to say, well, listen, I'm a child of God. I've got to just figure this out. I, it's just going to come naturally. No, this has to be learned. I have to, I, my kids have to observe me being able to be trusted, observe me that I can exchange love for their obedience. The, you, this is learned. And it compels us to honor and please with all we say and do. He who fears the Lord has secure a secure fortress. For his children, it will be a refuge. Church, I want you to know today that in, t- in the entire process, no matter where the Lord leads you this year, that he is a refuge that you can run to. That no matter how difficult it gets or how discouraging you get, that you know that you have a tower that you can flee into. That one who wants to protect you, one who wants to keep you safe. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23 says, Fear the Lord leads to life, then one rests content, untouched by trouble. Psalm 91, 9 through 12. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. See, it's not saying no harm will come to you, but no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Church, when the world in the outward is marked by apparent uncontrollability, I just made that word up, things that are out of control, you feel like you're being heaved and tossed and shaken, we can run not to the creation, but to the creator. And so, as we begin this series and we begin this year, 
I want us to somehow begin to ponder this blend between the fear of the Lord, this awe, this reverence, this thing that compels us to please the Father, and this confidence that comes through being a child of God. The fear of the Lord and the confidence of the Lord. Acts 9.31 says this way, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, and Brook County, enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Church, that's for us today. That when we live in this blend of the fear of the Lord and the confidence of the Lord, that he will encourage us by the Holy Spirit and that we will enter and enjoy a time of peace. Oswald Chambers says it this way, is the fear of the Lord is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Church, listen to that. When you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you will fear everything else. Church, when we fear God, we can then tell our Mind to take a break, amen? Just chill out, because God's got this. Because so often we feel like we have to tell the outside world, hey, listen, God's got this. But really the one we have to tell the most that God's got it is ourselves. So if you truly fear God, you don't have to fear your mind. It, it, the fear of the Lord can prevent the accusations of our conscience and bring our soul into a state of peace. The, the fear of the Lord, the fear of God, is an antidote against sin and temptation. A long time ago when I was a little boy or girl, they would be talking about somebody and they would say, hey, he was a God-fearing man. Or she was a God-fearing woman. And I never understood what that means. Like, wow, I don't really want to be afraid of God. Why are they so afraid of God? But now that I understand what the fear of God is, maybe there's no greater testimony to your life than to be one who fears God. Because within the fear of God, so much is entailed. Can I share with you a few more scriptures as we close? Psalm 112, verses 1 through 9 says it this way. Praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Number one, you'll find great delight in his commands when you fear him. Their children will be mighty in the land, and the generations to the upright will be blessed. It says something about our family when we fear the Lord. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. So that when everyone else is looking around and all they see is darkness, those who fear the Lord will see the light. Amen? God will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. See, the Father's eye is on you. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. Church, there is fruit that comes from fearing the Lord. Hating evil, delighting in God's word, good families, prosperity, light rising in and through the darkness, strength when we stand up to bear witness. Maybe the most famous passage about um, the fear of the Lord comes in in Proverbs 9.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. We know that one, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom. Well, good. It's not only the beginning of the wisdom. It seems like the Bible says that it's the end as well. Psalm 147, verse 11. The Lord delights in those who fear him. So church, not only does the fear of the Lord begin the process, 
but the favor of the Lord is on those who fear him. That we're prosperous. We end, it, we end well when we fear the Lord. I want the worship team to come back. And the last thing I want you to remember is this concept. The fear of God is the pole in which we fly the flag of faith. Listen to this. We so often talk in our lives about having faith and the faith in God. I want you to think about it this way. There's no denying what our faith is, right? Our faith is this. It's the big flag, right? And we wave this flag. We wave the flag of Jesus. We wave the flag of God. We wave the flag of faith. We wave the flag of forgiveness. We wave the flag of grace. But we cannot wave the flag without the pole of the fear of God. This is what waves that flag. When we come at our relationship with God with the pole of the fear, the fear of God, we respect God, we honor God, we have the all of God, we have the reverence of God, we are able to wave that flag. Wave the flag of grace, wave the flag of Jesus. This is what we always focus on and this is the most important part. This is what grace and forgiveness and Jesus but you know what? We cannot wave it unless we have a sturdy pole of the fear of God. And so today I want us to begin this process. And, and we probably won't talk about the fear of the Lord the rest of the series. And, and really in a lot of ways it doesn't even fit in the idea of the process of so. But I believe God's revealed that to us. Because we so, we so desperately, church, we want to be... We want to be successful. We want to see God move in our lives. We want to see prosperity. We want to see what we sow return to us, what we deposit reaped. And I really believe that in preparation for this series, God really wanted us to understand from the beginning. Number one, you're never going to know how I do it. Number two, you need to fear me and I'll bring it about. And I think that's the starting point. Next week, we're going to talk about sowing. We're going to talk about the harvest. We're going to talk about all these things that are more consistent with the idea of sow. But I really believe that the starting point to seeing God do something mighty in our lives starts with the fear of the Lord. And so today, I want to encourage you to um, think about three things. Um, number one, do you have something in the ground that you're a little bit concerned about? Hey, have you planted something? Have you sown something? Have you deposited something and you haven't seen anything come of it yet? If that's you today, I just want to encourage you that God is working. That your seed is safe. God knows what you planted. God knows what you sown. God knows what you deposited. And he's taking care of it. Do not fear. Maybe there's a group of you here today that are thinking, man, I, I've been meaning to sow that. I've been meaning to deposit that. I've been, been, been meaning to plant that, to do that, to step out, because I know that's my role. That's my job. That's what God's asking of me. I'm very clear what God has asked me to do. And you haven't done it yet. I, I want this message to be uh, just another kickstart to say, you know, maybe it's time that I plant that. Maybe it's time I sow that. And then there's the third group. Maybe you're here today and you've been racing around trying to plant and sow and do all these things and bring about a harvest. And, and maybe today you realize that it's not up to you. You're not going to be able to figure out how it happens. And maybe what God wants you today to do is just to begin to fear him. Just begin to respect him as God. Begin to surrender to his will and his way in your life. So I think that covers all of us. If you planted something, you haven't seen a return yet, continue to trust him. If he's called you to plant something, you haven't yet done it, consider doing it. And if you're here today and you need to just simply surrender God to God, I think that's exactly where the process starts.